teaching, we also have the restorative practices. Um, so we have restorative conversations. So when a student, um, you know, if students are in a conflict, we like to get them together, um, ask them, you know, what was happening, how what they were thinking or feeling, and then get them to kind of have empathy and realize how someone else might be feeling, um, you know, with the, with the situation. Um, so I think that's all I have to say, um, but I thank you for listening. Thank you. Be before we uh, move on to Monica, would uh, the board members have any questions for Hope? Um, Hope, it's Paul Costa here, uh, recently joined the board. Thank you so much for everything. And, um, so, you know, I'm, I'm learning so much so quickly, but uh, not, not necessarily staying up with everything. Um, I am keen to understand uh, pre-K and its impact on the intake of children uh, in, in, in your school. Uh, are you in a position to share with us any sense of, you know, can you determine um, a difference? in the children that have been through a pre-K program versus those that haven't? And what is your view on pre-K and, and the provision of it in our district? Sure, that's a good question. Um, I know at Cushing, we, we don't offer the, the, a pre-K program. Um, and at the moment, I'm not sure um, how many students in our kindergarten class have, have had um, a pre-K program. So I will defer your question to maybe somebody that has a little more information. Okay. Answer Thank that. You. Yep. I'm going to move on, Paul, because I'm I don't have the ability to answer that question with information out of my head. I could talk in generalities, but I I don't think that would be what you would like. So I think we need to come back to that one. I'm going to move on to Monica Karam. Monica. Wait, there are there other questions? I think John, like Rebecca, I think get a question. No, someone else have a question. I can hold it till the end. Okay. I, Any, I didn't see a hand. So, anybody else have a question for Hope? Okay. All right. And Monica, if you'd introduce yourself and tell the board who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Monica Karam. I'm the school counselor at South School in Rockland. It's a K-5 school. Um, I'm sorry, I missed your presentation. Hope my connection was lost. So, um, so I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of what we offer for students for SEL support. Um, in the classrooms, for kindergarten through fifth grade, we offer second step lessons, uh, and that's once a week. Um, we're doing, or we're working towards teacher follow through um, with those lessons. So every week they touch on um, a part of the lesson that we have taught. Um, I am dabbling in collecting data on student skill development through pre and post tests when it comes to second step um, to see what the students um, are acquiring from, from my teaching and from um, Ms. Brown's teaching, who is the school social worker. Um, we also have, um, we have myself, the school counselor, we have a school social worker, we have a special education clinical social worker who is dedicated to our ISP programs. And we run um, lunch groups, we run skill groups, um, specific skills related to SEL would be managing big feelings, um, emotional regulation, growth mindset, social skills, um, with a focus on friendships, um, boundaries. We also do a lot of game groups with our younger kids. Um, focusing on instruction with winning and losing and how to do that um, in a respectful way. We all do individual sessions with students as well. Um, and that can range from, again, managing feelings to, um, you know, confidence 
in the classroom um, when it comes to asking questions or raising your hand. Um, we also do a lot of um, work with students that are in the custody of DHS. Um, so we're supporting those students as well. Um, my colleague, Bethany Brown, the school social worker, does movement breaks with kindergarten and first graders daily. She takes them all um, and not at one time, but um, she kind of has a schedule for it. She takes them. We have a sensory station um, where kids get to do the a sensory walk. Um, so those are the types of things that the student services offers. So the school counselors and social workers offer. We also have SASM um, come in and do classroom lessons about boundaries, personal space, and healthy relationships. We also have a social justice and diversity alliance. Um, we have monthly themed classroom lessons that are delivered by the classroom teacher. Um, modeling that DEI work, so diversity, equity, and inclusion. So every month, the classroom teacher delivers a lesson um, related to that. We also have um, response to intervention for behavior. Um, some of you might be aware of the RTI for academics, um, for like math and literacy, but there was also a big need for that direct instruction for behavior as well. Um, so that is staffed by a teacher and an ed tech and they do individual social skill instruction. They um, use a pull out and push in model with students. Um, they work with the curriculum for zones of regulation, um, which is a great curriculum for students learning how to identify emotions, um, and what to do or how to get themselves back to, I like to say baseline or get back to um, calm. We also do restorative practices. Um, we have a dedicated time of day um, and a staff member to provide mediation and conduct restorative circles for larger groups of kids. Um, I would say Bethy and I do a lot of restorative conversations with students, um, but we do have someone that's dedicated to re um, restorative circles. We also have the RSU 13 after, um, after school program at South School, and they also provide a social skill instruction component as part of their programming. And we also have the Big Brothers Big Sisters program um, at South. And we're really working toward being a SEL integrated school, meaning that SEL isn't just a standalone um, class or a standalone thing that's taught just by um, me or the school social worker. We want it woven into the child's day um, completely so that it's a you know, it's used as an approach to every struggle or any type of struggle that's happening in the classroom. Um, so as adults, we need to model positive emotional or what positive emotional and social skills look like. So that's something that we're moving towards um, is having it really woven into the, the child's day and having adults modeling that behavior. Um, yeah, so that's what cell school is doing. Um, we're also trying to turn a lot of things over to the students that adults would typically manage. So like assemblies, morning announcements, we're having podcasts done by the kids, um, school events. So we're trying to turn over that those types of things to the students so that they have that sense of belonging and that sense of worth, which is um, really important when it comes to um, students' social, emotional, and uh, mental health. Monica, thanks so much for sharing. Um, questions for Monica or questions, anyone who didn't get to ask Hope a question? 
Go ahead, Rebecca. Okay. I was going to save it, but Monica, that was a lot. Thank you so much. Like, it sounds like you're doing a ton over at South School. And what I'm curious about is um, you said that you are playing with or kind of trying to do some data collection. Mm -hmm. And with all the programming you have going on, um, two things. One, what do you think is missing? Um, what is still needed? And also, um, how do you think it's working with all those programs? What's working? What's not working? I think what's working is um, I really think the second step lessons um, are working well because we're in our third or fourth year of using the curriculum. So I feel um, I feel more comfortable and like I know the curriculum. So I think that's working well. Um, it was a learning curve for me, so I feel like I know it now so that I'm more comfortable teaching it. Um, can you repeat the rest of your question? Sure, of course. Um, I'm curious also just like, what do you think's not working and what's missing like in your experience? Because you've got so many programs, mm -hmm. but like what's missing to, in your experience? Oh, gosh. Um, I feel like for so long, this is like my 10th or 11th year in the district. And I think from where we've started at South School, um, we've come so, so far that I feel, I can't think of anything that's missing because we've worked so hard to get where we're at that I feel like we're doing so well that I can't, I can't think of anything that's missing. Um, it wasn't a, it wasn't a quiz. I know. <laughs> Monica, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a question sort of related to Rebecca's question in a different way. Since yes. social and emotional learning is so, um, concerned with interpersonal communication, do you notice and do the teachers notice that students are using the language of second step? Yes, so um, my office is housed in the K-1 wing um, and Bethany teaches the K-1 lessons, but I do hear the teachers using the language that Bethany uses. I hear the kids using it. I've had students come into my room um, and I'm, I, have a, I have a big feelings group with two first grade students. And so I don't teach their classroom lessons, but I'm seeing them for a group and they will say, oh yeah, Miss Brown taught me to put my hand on my belly and say, you know, say stop, I'm feeling angry and that I need to take deep breaths. So there's definitely a transfer of skill from the classroom lessons to outside the outside the classroom. Thank you. And when and when like Justin has um Justin the principal has students in his office, he uses the language too. He'll talk about empathy with students. He'll talk about problem solving. Um, so I think it's slowly getting to the point where the whole school is embracing the language. Um, but I think that's maybe that's what's missing is that it still needs to get further out. It needs to spread. Um, that would be my Spread, my spread where? Spread what? where? spread where like throughout the entire school community the la the language that's being used um in the classrooms during lessons okay i guess this is just a follow-up thought and not something that has to be answered but also i'd be curious to know if you if anybody is hearing any of the language or any feedback from parents like what's happening like how is it showing up at home how is it impacting the way that the staff is able to in, and and is interacting with families. Does that is it shifting that relationship as well as a because you mentioned wanting it to be integrated and I'm thinking about um, like a holistic model of social emotional learning, which is it becomes something that kids take home too. And so how does it come? How do we see it interacting with with the families that we work with? And you don't have to answer that. It's just a me thinking out loud. I have an answer for you. Like one. Great. I sure I'll always take that. <laughs> um, so we use Class Dojo as a um 
medium to to talk with families. Um, and Bethany is really good about posting what her lessons are about um, and how families can speak to their children about the lessons and using them at home. So I know that there is that connection between um, what's being taught and it being disseminated out to families. But it would be good to have more feedback from families back to us. Sarah had a question. Monica and Hope, um, attend on your, your work. Um, we've also heard that there's a lot of new teachers um, this year or maybe over the past few years. How do uh, some of the new teachers get, you know, onboarded with SEL and I mean, it sounds like that you guys are doing much of the work yourselves and your your partners there, um, but the regular teachers as well, you know, how do they kind of learn and what's happening and how are they integrated into their classrooms? I know in the past we've, um, you know, had dedicated staff meetings or even the beginning of the year staff meetings to um, talking about how the teachers can, you know, bring in the support of SEL and just weave it into their everyday activities. And I know um, one year I kind of um, created a, a folder for, for every, every teacher and with just, you know, different ideas that they could, you know, explore or, or try with their classroom. Other questions? Ready to move on to the middle school? Thank you, Monica. You're welcome. Thank you both for that was great. And if you have further questions, I know I talked pretty fast and there was a lot of information. You can always email me. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'm gonna to turn to Colden and I see Dej here as well. Colden, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I will. I will uh, hand it over to Dej and let her. Uh, yeah, talk about some of the things we're working on at the middle school. Thanks, Colden. Um, yeah, I think that a lot of the objectives that Hope and Monica spoke to, as far as SEL ob objectives go, are things we certainly are working on in a myriad of ways as well at the middle school. And um, someone asked, I think Rebecca asked the question of like, do we see that second step language and work um, rippling out into, you know, home or other places? And we certainly see the students that come from South school using that language um, when they enter sixth grade. So just to follow up on that, um, there's a bunch of different things that we are doing at the middle school. Um, we also have just began to uh, begun to implement second step. Um, I think we're doing it in seventh, sixth and seventh grade. Um, and that's done by our school, uh, school counselors right now. Um, and I'm sorry, my name's Nadesh. <laughs> I'm a uh, general education social worker at the middle school. Um, this is my second year there. And um, Let's see, so we've got second step that's just beginning. Um, we also have um, BAR, which stands for Building Assets Reducing Risks. We started that program uh, last at the beginning of last year. And um, there's several, there's many components to the program. It's really an all-inclusive program with uh, that really hopes to um, bring together all of the different work that we're doing and help to uh, help all of our teachers and student services and administration administration to communicate across um, the sort of silos that sometimes we tend to work in. Um, so we have uh, small black meetings, which are where teachers get together and they go through and talk about every single student that they have. Um, they talk about their strengths, uh, their connections to school, um, they sort of give them a level of concern. Um, and then based on that, there is a goal and an intervention that's created. Um, if a student rises to a, a higher level of concern, we, we go to big block meetings and we, we discuss them with 
um, somebody from student services and an administrator. Um, and then we also have risk review meetings that happen every single week. And that's with just our student services team. Um, and we're really looking at how we might be able to support students um, socially, emotionally, and also looking at sort of some of the like hierarchy of needs thing. So do we have the basic, do, do, do these students have access to um, their, their basic needs and resources and what does the family need as well? Um, with this program, we also have a, an iTime curriculum, which is a social emotional learning curriculum that's implemented in every classroom during our compass time. Um, that's done every Monday. And it's, um, it is, the curriculum is done by the teachers. And so that really, I think helps integrate some of the social emotional learning curriculum um, into the like teacher's way of speaking and talking about these things. It's not just student services that's, um, that's working with kids around these goals. Um, and let's see, I think a big part of what our student services team does is uh, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with students, a lot of um, uh, restorative practices, conversations around harm. Um, and I think a, a big shift from elementary to middle school is that we have students that have a little more autonomy and are really, really starting to think about their identity. So <laughs> we do a lot of um, trying to connect students to community resources and make sure they they have other adults in their lives that they can look to for support. Um, we're also doing restorative practices at the middle school. Um, I think that looks similar to what we're seeing at elementary and middle and uh, high school level. Um, we also have 21st century after school programming. Um, so that happens Monday through Thursday. Um, trying to think of some other things that are going on. Um, with the GSTA just started back up. So our Gay Straight Trans Alliance is a group for LGBTQ plus students and allies um, to gather, get support, um, connect with one another and advocate for the school to be a uh, like safer, more inclusive space for all students. Um, yeah, those are the things that are <laughs> sort of rising to the top of my mind right now. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to fill in, Colden. Colden, I wonder if you could just touch briefly on the conversation we had about the, tracker, the Trackers Partnership. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a lot so, of yeah, Absolutely. So we, um, we've been talking with trackers a little bit because they approached us because they're doing some um, school outreach work with St. George uh, this fall. And so we've been talking with them about doing some outreach work at our school, um, and particularly with our seventh grade. Uh, that's for a couple of reasons. One, students uh, are able to start accessing trackers in seventh grade. So that makes a you know, really kind of logical opportunity uh, to connect with them. And our seventh grade in particular um, has a lot of social emotional needs. Um, that I would say, at least to me, feel more apparent than the other grade levels, which is not to say that those needs don't exist. But um, so we've been looking for, <laughs> excuse me, um, kind of an intervention that we could work with on a larger scale in seventh grade. So starting uh, in our in the second semester, Trekkers is going to be coming in once a week, um, working with up to 60 students a week um, and doing some activities, some really traditional Trekkers activities. So looking like team building, uh, leadership activities, mentoring, uh, reflection, and also trying to just really make kind of a fun experience for those kids. So hoping to kind of accomplish two things. One, to provide some really um, direct social emotional support uh, for a larger group of our students who are in need of it uh, right now. And then also to build hopefully some enthusiasm and connection with Trekkers as an organization uh, in hopes that some of those students, and, and we know many of them will, but hopefully even more will, you know, take that partnership further and, and hopefully stay with Trekkers, you know, through the remainder of their career uh, in the district. So we're looking forward to starting that in the second semester and that, that will go all the way through June. Um, so that's going to be available uh, for students to kind of on a first come for serve for students and parents to, you know, if they want to sign their student up. Uh, to do that during compass time. So it's at school, um, you know, taking away as many barriers as possible for students to have that experience. Mark? Uh, okay, so you, you said that 
students and their parents have to sign up for this. Um, who is eligible? I mean, is it any any student who wants to uh, join up for this? Is there a a cap on the number of students who can participate? And and at what point in the time of the day is this like an after school kind of a thing, or uh, how is that all working? Uh, so yeah, so truckers can take up to sixty kids. Uh, for this program. So it's really going to be a first come first serve. There's no, you know, there are no benchmarks necessarily for students. Um, we certainly have a list of students that we're going to work really hard to uh, get them into that program, but it's going to be really first come first serve. Um, it's going to be during our compass time, which is in the middle of the day. Uh, that's when, <clears throat> sorry, that's kind of uh, our sort of flex time. We stuff a lot of things into compass uh, but we're going to put trekkers in there. So that's for seventh grade, that's 1101 to 1150. So they'll have that opportunity during the school day uh, for up to 60 kids. Um, I don't know if we'll get 60 kids, but we have that opportunity. So that's over half of the seventh grade class that can access that. And, and they're working in a large group or you break them into small subgroups and there's X amount of uh, personnel uh, overseeing the activities. Yeah, we're going to break them into smaller groups. So Trekkers is going to come uh, two days a week and they're going to bring two staff each day. So they'll work with, we have two seventh grade uh, teams. And so they'll work with one team one day, one, one team the next day. So it'd probably be more like 25 or so students on average um, at a time. And then they, they have two staff so they could break them in, in even into even smaller groups uh, depending on what they're doing. Thank you. Uh, Colton, Paul Costa here. Um, so I, I think you have a number of children that are actually uh, experiencing behavioral issues, right? Um, no, no surprise there. I'm sure you always do. But is it an unusually large number? Are, the, are they unusually difficult behavioral issues? And can you just kind of contextualize it a little bit? Because, you know, I'm listening to all of this and everything sounds so hunky-dory. I'm, you know, kind of everything sounds great, but we know it's not. Um, so you have some challenges. What what are those challenges, and how did they arise? Um, sure. Yes, we do have some challenges. Uh, certainly, I think that it, it's it's hard to say, Paul, necessarily. You know, in terms of comparisons back for a few years, because there's so many factors involved. I think that our behaviors, as compared to last year, which this is only my second year in the district. Um, our behaviors compared to the last year, I think we have seen, and, and Dej certainly weigh in, I think we've seen some improvement in terms of um, we have seen less kind of, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what the word is, we're seeing less aggressive behavior than we saw last year, um, but we certainly have a lot of students that are really struggling with emotional regulation. Um, and, and I think I would say being able to work through um, any sort of conflict or obstacle, um, it, it feels to me, and uh, this is really just a feeling, but it feels like students are really struggling to work through anything that that is hard. Um, and I think we spend a lot of our day coaching students who are oftentimes hitting a, a, a wall in whatever area and saying, I'm done, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm done with this, you know, coaching them through that and trying to bring them back into the fold. Um, so I think that that certainly, yes, that's certainly difficult. So I would, as I guess in, in further context, I think that, yes, we do have a lot of behavioral concerns. We are, I think, making progress in some of those areas, but we are seeing students who are really struggling to manage, um, any sort of negative emotion and it's coming out in ways that they're struggling to control. Well, what can the board do to help? address this issue if if there's anything maybe it's you know it's just the parents and the teachers and and, and, and rightly so but is there anything that we should be thinking about in terms of the allocation of resources or programs that should be initiated initiated etc yeah that's a good i appreciate that question um the the two things that come to mind for me is i think we're seeing um you know, and, and there's two ways to look at this piece, I suppose, but we're seeing more and more students who are really struggling to fit into the traditional model of school. Um, 
And, and I'm not sure, to be honest, if, if there are more students now who are struggling with that than there were maybe five years ago, or if it's just a lot more apparent right now because of the way that they're demonstrating that need. Um, but we have a lot of requests and, and students asking for alternative programming. And we do have an alternative program, um, which we, you know, we utilize certainly, but we're seeing just, I think, more than we have capacity for, um, and also more requests for, it, I think, for, for program, and I mean this, I don't think they're actually asking for this, because they, I think they don't know it could exist, but asking for programs that are a lot more um, flexible and exploratory for students. Um, I came, I worked in a high school previously, and there's a lot more resources in a high school setting for ways for students to earn their credits, um, you know, with all kinds of online options, adult ed, you know, MCST and RSU 13, which is fantastic. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to put those different four-year plans together. In middle school, we really don't have that. We, we, we have middle school, you take your classes, and then you go on to high school. And I think that that's, we're seeing that need become ever more apparent um, all the way down in sixth grade with students who are really having trouble. You know, they're, they're not really able to just sit in class and learn in this way. And so we're seeing behavior issues from that and, and alternative programming that is either full or doesn't exist yet. So I think the way that the board can help with that, I think, you know, I suppose the, the the easy answer would be money, right? But I think that we need to do some explore exploring in our district as to how do we, what are some of these resources we could utilize for middle school kids and and probably even younger. I won't speak for elementary, but I think that probably they're seeing that too. Just students who are really struggling in the model, and as we try to continue to force them back into the model, you know, it's getting harder and harder to do so. But the model is one of, uh, you know, the traditional model, right, is one of uh, ultimately academic achievement with the objective of, you know, kind of opening up as many options as possible for the child and the, as they transition into adulthood. I, I can't help feeling that, you know, by offering so many options, you are confusing the whole role of the school and the, and the, and and the child as well as being presented with agency which is perhaps beyond what they're entitled to i don't know i'm just saying this as a, a you know kind of with an old school hat on here but um you know i, I do worry a little bit that we, we you know the kids are supposed to knuckle down right <laughs> and learn and learn in a traditional manner well i think i think paul well, to that point saying... i think that the role of Go ahead, Colton. Sorry, Lauren. <laughs> I would say I think the role of the school is expanding far beyond what it traditionally used yeah. to be. Um, for many of our kids, the school is the institution that is providing, you know, we're there for the academics, the social emotional piece. We're providing the food, the clothes, the dental care. You know, we're, we're really, I think, far beyond the role of the traditional school. And I, I guess I personally believe that we can either, you know, invest in providing the resources and expanding our ability to support kids, or we can not and see a lot of consequences, you know, for the long-term growth of our community and for on the more immediate sense for the behaviors that we're struggling with at school. So <clears throat> I think, you know, to my request, I would say I'm not looking for the ability to provide 15 or different pathways to kids, but I think right now, we kind of have like one and a half options. You know, we have the traditional pathway, we have our alternative program, which is still within the school, still largely within a relatively traditional pathway. So I think just, you know, able to expand that a little bit, provide a few more options for students to have some agency, support them to make those decisions, um, I think is something that would be really important in the middle school setting and would pay off uh, for us. Okay. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can't agree more, uh, Colton, with what you said. And and that's, you know, that's the understanding and what we have to be now as a modern school district is we need to be things that were either not thought of before and should have or remarkably needed now that maybe weren't so much. And we have to somehow remember 
there were effects of COVID on our kids as well. And there's remarkable effects of social media on our kids, like remarkably. So there are forces affecting our children and our students um, that are new and more challenging than years past. But in our district, with our goals of relationship proficiencies and pathways, we clearly recognize all that and support all of you in, in pursuing whatever you need to do to fulfill that. Other questions? Yes, Rebecca. Um, Brad, I saw your hand. Did you have something you wanted to add to? Yeah, it was just following up. I think Golden and, and Lauren addressed Paul's uh, question pretty well. I, I would just also add that, Paul, I think it's important that um, maybe you spend some time in the schools before, you know, suggesting we limit the pathways that the students have. Um, I, I think these students and the student in this generation have unique challenges that were not in existence even five years ago. I think this is a very different world that we're living in. I think there, there are a whole host of social emotional issues, um, issues derived from media, from you know, social iso isolation, anxiety. I think we have to really think forward instead of looking backward. And to me, um, I would encourage us to develop additional pathways to meet the needs of students today rather than think, okay, we have to sort of fit students into a particular mold that maybe was good for students 10, 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, to the extent that you're able to, you know, have some time in the, in the schools and see some of the issues that students are dealing with, um, I think there are also some great uh, research out there, and I, I'd be happy to talk with you outline, offline and, and recommend some, some really good reading that really goes into details about why this generation of students are facing unique challenges and why we need to stay ahead of that curve. Thanks. Um, Other questions? I have a question that's not related to this um, exactly. Uh, I mean, it is related to this. It's not related to what um, the what Brad was just saying. So Colden, I'm wondering, um, you mentioned trekkers. And we've also talked about data collection. And I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to be able to do some data collection that we can then have for SEL um, data, uh, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, so like in terms of how many students actually attend, um, what are the goals of the trekkers um, activity? Uh, like, and, and then how are those goals, like were the goals achieved? Um, I understand that that might be outside your personal scope, but maybe you could ask, we could figure out a way for trekkers to do that because I think it's really valuable for when, when we talk about alternative pathways to be able to have the data that shows of different ways that we're engaging, that we also can, can come and present the data that, that justifies having these alternative um, opportunities. I um, Rebecca, I just, uh, I, my daughter's in Trekkers and I'm familiar with their leadership and their board. And that is actually part of the work they've been doing for the last, I think, three years is designing, you know, qualitative and quantitative data capturing for exactly this. So in terms of this program, I don't know if they, they're planning on it, but I know that it is um, an ongoing project that they're working on. So it, it would definitely be worth, um, you know, someone talking directly to them um, because I think that they recognize how important that <clears throat> that kind of data is. So it'd be great if we could, uh, you know, join forces or, you know, have access to it, 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 at least in the helping to build any kind of case for alternative programming. Trekkers um, originally implemented the same programming or similar programming at the St. George School. Um, and I believe that they have a pre and post evaluation. So I'll I'll definitely follow up Rebecca with them and see um, what they currently have and if there's a way to maybe bolster some of that. Cause I agree, it's great to capture some of the data and um, let that inform next steps. Thanks. Uh, Colden, you, you um, previously talked about Bar being a little clunky. Um, we're, you know, we've got a little bit more um, experience with it now um, through this uh, academic year. Um, how's it going? Is it uh, is the teacher buy-in 
improving and you know is the med method and practice going smoothly um i think it is improving i think you know the i guess speaking per particularly to i time uh because that's maybe most relevant to this discussion um i think i mentioned this in my presentation a few months ago but um one of the things that's really fantastic is Dej and a couple of other uh teachers spent some time over the summer really tailoring the i times to grade levels um and trying to put together a more relevant progression because to be quite frank not all of the i times work that well uh and they don't always work that well for every grade level so i think that that's been something that's been helpful <coughs> um it's still it you know it's still a little bit mixed in terms of buy-in and, and appreciation for i time um but i think that people are you know coming around there are some real champions of i time among the teachers uh, who are doing a nice job um promoting that um <clears throat> but i think we have more work to do there I, I still think that we are working this year because we really didn't do big block last year uh, big block is kind of the clunky spot right now where we're trying to figure out how to make big block work well for us because that's the thing about bar i think is that it is it is kind of packaged as a program and it is but it's also not because you have to take the elements and really fit them into your school and then also fit your school into bar and so that's why it's a you know a three-year process with a coach as we try to work our way in so i think that small block meetings which again are our smaller team meetings are working smoothly. A lot of our teachers really appreciate the opportunity to, to do that and, and talk about kids um, and are finding that to be productive. And Big Block is where we're focusing right now to try to, um, excuse me, to try to make it smoother and really work for our school. Um, I think at the same time, we're still working on risk review because one of the things that we're struggling with at risk review is we get students at that level. Um, and again, risk review is our, our sort of highest level of student support team meetings um, where we're not totally sure what type of intervention or what interventions to try here because we're we're getting some kids who are at really really high levels of need um, and so when we have those meetings which we often do you know we're meeting with students and, and parents um, you know when parents are saying to us I don't know what to do things like that you know, so that I think the growth needed in risk review is continuing to expand our intervention um, bank so to speak um, and part of that falls into programming and like that but again I think that small block is going quite well I think I time is improving and big block is where we're really trying to focus our development efforts for the year may I also just really quickly speak to that um and um just maybe share a little like answer very candidly and share just a tiny bit of feedback which is I think that one of the reasons why bar has been such an uphill climb is because it was a program that was um was handed to the schools from the district level and I understand there are moments when we see a need and an opportunity for change and we have to just tell people this is what we're doing, right? Um, <laughs> and I think there is some real benefits to BAR. I mean, I'm the BAR coordinator um, and I I get to really like understand the components of it. Um, but I think that the way that sometimes we go about implementing things in schools in general, I'm not saying that this is unique to this district, um, is that we say, okay, there's this really cool new program. Um, let's just sort of give it to them and make them do it. Um, and whether it's cool or not, people have an immediate, their walls go up and they have an immediate resistance to it because schools are oftentimes given many shiny new programs. Um, and those programs sometimes last, but oftentimes do not. Um, and so I think as somebody that, you know, has been trying to champion bar in the school, I think our biggest hurdle is that um, teachers feel like they were never asked whether or not this was something that would be helpful and something that they needed. And so I think just going forward as we think about, you know, I think we're having conversations around like what SEL programming would be helpful. 
um, as we think about that, let's really make sure that we're doing good work to like Rebecca suggested, like collect that data. What are, um, what are teachers seeing? What are students, what are, what are, what are students want, you know, cause they have the best read on what's really going on. What are their fears at school? What are the things that they feel like could be improved? Um, and what are the solutions that they see? Right. So, I just want to put that out there that I think that's one of the reasons why bar has felt clunky is that um, it's been met with, with resistance because there wasn't any initial buy-in or opportunity for, for teachers to sort of give their two cents or, um, and it, it wouldn't even need to be like, this is a choice you all have, <laughs> um, but really like, hey, let's have some initial conversations around it before we implement something um, school-wide or district-wide. So just a, just a thought as we continue with these conversations around SEL and, and programming. And sometimes I can't wait because I know what's good for schools. <laughs> and that's also part of what I do. And sometimes I can't wait because I have money that I need to spend. <laughs> so John- I'll take the lump, I'll take the lump for that one. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. so John, in terms of SEL, I think then as a board, what is really helpful is if if we make sure that the oversight is if you're going to ask for or you're going to implement new curriculum that we're informed so that we can offer feedback as needed. And I think and and that also like in terms of sustainability. So it's not a it's not a you're like in trouble. And of course, this is really complicated and it's not just a matter of like we you we can't, we can, but I, I can imagine us being able to have more transparent conversations about SEL curriculum moving forward at the board level, if possible. Well, my retort to that is I was actually asked by a past board to move forward with this and the board was fully informed when we did, but yes, I totally get that. And we do try to do that, but I was moving forward at the urging of the board, not solely of my own accord, even though I think it's a great program. Yeah, you know, I to be clear, I don't I, think it's a bad program. I just want to make sure that's out there. I just um I just think that the way that things are implemented oftentimes really matters to, you know, how people take them up and to the degree um the fidelity to which they are followed through with. Yeah, I can say as a board member for a long time that I've been a big fan of the bar model and, and the freshman academy, which are really the basically the same thing. And the kind of data we were getting five or seven years ago about the freshman academy based on the bar model was staggeringly good. So I was I was a, a sold board member from a long time ago that is an effective approach for caring relationships and building confidence and um, academic achievement in, in, in students. So I, I get what you're saying, Dej, and I and I, I think that's part of the struggle of a board of the board is like we're you know the buck stops with us in terms of the public and what we're elected to do, and we try to support things that we think are best. Uh, we also try to stay in our lane, and we also know that staff buy-in is a huge part of success. It's all together, and somehow we need to do the the really wonderful dance that we have to do uh, to encourage things and support things and understand that. It's all about staff and implementing. And if it feels right, it feels right. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But moving on, um, anything else for our middle school folks? Well, I, I don't really want to move on right now because I, I just want to make sure that with all of these programs that we have some kind of review process. I'm sure you do. Uh, and that um, we somehow or other quantify the outcomes of them. And if they're not delivering what we want, that we remediate the program itself or dump it, of course. Uh, I assume that that is all part of the process here. We don't just launch into these many acronym uh, uh, named uh, programs and just kind of just watch them happen without trying to understand which ones are working, which are not. I, I think starting particularly with BAR, I know that, uh, you know, particularly we spend a lot of time and Dev spends a lot of time reviewing, you know, talking with here, you know, talking with receiving feedback, talking with our bar coach um, and continually trying to improve our practices. I do think to be very candid, um, 
we have moved faster to implement things right now than we have to make to come up with the kind of che the data check. And I think from my perspective as the one who, you know, is responsible, you know, for a lot of these things and responsible for the school, that is we're under a lot of pressure, a lot of not from the district, but from, you know, I think our community, I assume you all know that, right? A lot, we're, we're really trying to work really hard to find the thing that's going to help our students. And so we're implementing multiple things at the same time, which of course is not the best way to really come up with clear data on the on one thing in particular, um, but our kids are really struggling. And so it feels like more important to work quickly to find interventions that work for our kids than, um, you know, to kind of play out the long-term study process. So I think, Paul, yes, that needs to be a really key part, uh, you know, a review process as to what we're using, how it's working, is it producing results? Um, but I will be very candid and say that I don't think we, or I would say we have not developed those at the same rate that we have implemented things because we're really trying to find uh, options to help our kids who are really struggling right now. That that also, you know, it's important to say that, you know, for our kids who are really struggling, the SEL environment for them is really important, but also is effective treatment and interventions, you know, if they want to do it, if their parents want them to do it. And if we can find it, so it is that just goes without saying for for any humans who are really struggling, that treatment is also an important part of things as well. Further thoughts, questions, or ideas from for middle school folks? Okay, seeing none, John, go go ahead. No, I'm going to turn to Cooper Marshall, our high school assistant principal. Cooper, do you want to introduce your your folks, or how you how do you want to do this? Yeah, um, I'll speak uh, a little bit about overall um, some of the things we're doing in the high school, and then also just share some of what I think are some goals and some things that we want to continue improving and working on. And then I'm going to pass it over to Bud Perkins. Uh, Bud is um, one of the teachers in our special ed. Um, intensive support programs. Um, and he's going to talk about some of the really interesting work that um, they're doing around SEL um, in his program and, and can speak a little bit more about what that program is for those who might not be familiar with. Uh, we also have Jillian Barnard, who is a student at uh, Oceanside High School, um, who is going to kind of speak from a student perspective as well. Um, Great. So... Um, you know, I, I would say that, um, I, so this is my third year at the high school. Um, so I started kind of, um, in the midst of, um, kind of the deep COVID year when, um, we were having the cohort model, um, and students were not, uh, in school every day. Um, and so I've, um, had, um, you, you know, I think one thing we've been doing since I've started is really trying to build back up since COVID um, and um, reinstore some of the things that we had before COVID that we had to put on hold, but also start some new things um, as well. Um, and I think one of the things that we've tried to really revamp that we had in some form before COVID, but um, have revamped is our advisory program. Um, and so I think it's similar to... Um, some of the work happening at the middle school, which I think is great because then when kids transition up here, um, they're seeing a lot of the same things. So um, at the high school, the way that it works is that every student comes in freshman year with an, advi with, with an advisor. Um, they meet their advisor and do a lot of SEL-based um, team building work um, during our freshman orientation. Um, that advisor helps them, um, you know, basically kind of get to know the lay of the land um, it's a support person for them at any point during the school day or school year, um, a trusted adult that they have right off the bat, um, and they stick with that same advisor and that same advisory group for all four years of high school. Um, and um, we, um, you know, I last year we also, um, I think, restarted our advisor program. We were also doing I, the iTime um, curriculum. Um, in our advisory um, 
last year, which uh, Dej had talked about, um, that's based around social emotional learning. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that work that we did last year was overseen by our school counselors, and we um, currently don't have uh, any full-time school counselor at the, at the high school. Um, so we have had to, um, you know, make a couple of changes based on staffing shortages and other work that um, our support staff has picked up. So we've had to um, put the I time on hold this year, but we're still, you know, we still look at our advisory program as um, part of our social emotional learning work, um, you know, that we're doing with students. Um, one of the other one, um, things that we're doing um, and that I do a lot just in a disciplinary role um, is our work around restorative justice. Um, and so really trying to find ways for students to really reflect on behavioral issues, whether it's peer-to-peer -peer conflicts, whether it's um, student-teacher issues, classroom issues, um, you know, and really reflect on what was the harm done and how can we re repair that relationship or repair that damage, whether, whether it's, you know, to a person or to a school. Um, you know, we've had, we've had students do community service work uh, after school as um, sort of like an alternative disciplinary consequence, um, and have actually found a lot of success in that, and students have really felt proud of the work that they've done, um, and we've seen um, actually like a, a pretty substantial reduction in um, suspensions this year, and I would say um, repeat offenders. Um, especially amongst our incoming freshmen, um, students who, you know, have have a conflict or get in trouble, you know, it, early on in the year. Um, I think we've done a good job of, of using restorative practices, helping them reflect, doing some of that social emotional learning work. And, um, and we haven't seen a ton of, of um, repeat offenses. Um, and that is something that I thought a lot about last summer um, and trying to really get creative with discipline, because I, if we if you look at our suspension rates from last year, they were really, really high. Um, there was a lot of repeat um, customers. <laughs> uh, and so it felt like what we were doing wasn't working because the same kids were doing the same stuff. Um, and so, you know, I know Jesse Barkey and I really spent a lot of time reflecting on how we do discipline. And I think that we are in the moving in the right direction um, in that term. Um, one general education program that we have that um, I'm sure a lot of the board knows about, but is something that um, being new to Maine um, since I started here that I really love is our Jobs for Maine Graduates JMG program. Um, so uh, Jane Ann Reinick is our JMG specialist. Um, and so this program really helps students um, build a lot of those soft skills that are really essential for employment and for success after high school, whether they go on to college um, or join the workforce or the military. Um, and it's really incredible to see the work that she does with um, some of our most at-risk students, um, kids that came in freshman year who could barely sit through a class period without needing to take a break or, you know, take a walk in the halls, you know, they're, they are leading their class. Um, you know, she has students rotate and, and lead class and, you know, she, she's doing mindfulness exercises with, um, you know, football players. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just the culture that she has built in that program and the pride that kids feel and the confidence that they feel around themselves and, um, you know, their ability to be leaders and their ability to, you know, mature and be reflective and, and take ownership of their schoolwork and their behavior um, is something that has been really encouraging to me. So I think that Jane Ann Reinick, um, you know, is, I think, one of the strongest um you know, her, 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 the work she's doing in JMG is some of the, the best work we're doing around SEL. Um, and I wish we, we could have more students in that program. Um, some of the uh, SEL work that I would really like to 
uh, kind of build on. Um, you know, I think, I think part of this is COVID. I think part of this is just, um, teenagers, but I think we could really use some work on building resiliency and stamina among our students. Um, I think one thing that our school does really well is um, meeting kids where they're at and giving kids multiple opportunities for success. Um, and we have really great support systems. I know our freshman academy, I think Lauren mentioned that. Um, so we have freshman and sophomore academy. We have our risk review team. Um, you know, we offer all sorts of different recovery options for students throughout the school year um, to be able to, um, you know, make sure they're they're having multiple pathways to success. But I think we're still seeing, you know, some pretty challenging issues around truancy. I think we're seeing some pretty challenging issues around, um, you know, some of our failure rates. Um, I think a lot of that is just. Um, you know, a lot of the issues I see just resiliency and and students, um, you know, just not, you know, we we can put in seventy percent, but but we need those kids to to do the the, the last thirty, um, and so you know, I'm thinking a lot about that now because we're coming into midterms and it's kind of crunch time for a lot of kids, and I know it's something that we've talked about a lot in our support team. So that's something that I'm thinking about. Um, and want to do a little bit more digging on some ways that we can really build resiliency among our students. Um, I, I, another, um, you know, talking about pathways and, and SEL, I think that our alternative education program, NOVA, does a lot of really great work around social emotional learning. Um, I know that um, both Nicole Hatch, our student support coordinator, and Hannah Fazy, our school social worker, do a lot of SEL work with our alternative ed um students and um we've really kind of started to rebuild that program this year with two new uh teachers who are um doing really amazing work and so i want to definitely continue to expand um the amount of kids that can be in that program because we have a pretty long wait list and also some of the seo work um that we're doing in that program i think that there could be a lot of overlap with some of the work that we do in J jmg um, and then again, you know, hopefully when we are more fully staffed, I think we can continue to build on the SEL work we're doing in advisory, try to get back um, to the ITIME curriculum, because I think a lot of that was really useful. Um, so before I pass along to Mr. Perkins, who um, is going to be focusing on some of the work we're doing in special ed, I want to just pause and ask if there are any questions about anything that I had mentioned. Stamina. So we've talked about resilience at the school board and understand you know, certain parts of that, but I was curious about the word stamina and why you use the word stamina also. You know, I think Colden mentioned something about just kids struggling to just make it through the school day. And, you know, we have 75 minute blocks at our school. And I think that I, you know, um, I often just see kids struggling to just keep it up through the day and just really kind of maintain the focus and the work through the school day, through a, through a week. I think over the course of a year, um, I think kids can start to, uh, you know, I, I think historically having, you know, been working in a high school for a long time, that third quarter dip, um, you know, is something that <laughs> I see Jillian nodding. <laughs> um, you know, I think kids just get fatigued and burnt out um, and so how can we help and encourage our students to maintain that stamina to really be successful for the whole school year? That's, that's okay. kind of what I'm thinking when I, when I think of that word. All right. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Seeing none, then Bud, you want Bud, Bud to talk next? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, yeah, so as Cooper said, I'm Bud Perkins. I'm a teacher in the ISP program at the high school. Um, I work with the Neptune and the North Star programs. Um, and I just wanted to go over kind of what we do for social emotional learning, kind of what our program looks like in that sense. Um, and, you know, looking at the three goals that the district has, I'm going to start with pathways and kind of what that looks like for our students. Obviously, the diploma is where we want to get to if that's where they would like to go. Another option is a lot of continuing education. We look into that as an option for a pathway. 
as well as if they're looking to just going to work, going for employment. The other thing is if they're not on a diploma path, there's two different tracks in the high school. We look at their uh, living arrangements, services. And as I um, have said many times, ultimately happiness is my goal for my students after high school. Um, proficiencies, we have to meet the same standards as the high school mainstream classes to give them the credits. So we still try, we teach with those standards. We work with the general ed teachers to get the curriculum to present the curriculum in the appropriate way. We also use specialized design instruction because it's special ed, uh, special education. Um, but the relationships is the part that I really focus on in our program because that's where our students have the greatest challenges. They don't have a lot of relationships with school or with the school personnel. They don't have a lot of positive relationships with peers. Um, so the program I, I found, which was, I, I started this search three years ago when I started around the same time as Colden, or not Colden, uh, <laughs> Cooper, sorry. Um, and the program I found is called School Connect. Um, the reason why I chose it first, I'll just dive into that. It was peer reviewed and sponsored by CASEL, which is the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. It's also included in the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices through SAMHSA, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So basically what that program is, is it comes in eight modules. It's all web-based this time. The School Connect 3.0, where we started, was all um, physical. Like you had uh, actual workbooks where the, the lesson plans were all in a three-ring binder. And then you photocopied the assignments for the students and handed them out, worked with them in groups. So now it's all web-based. And the 4.0, the reason why we switched from the 3.0 to the 4.0 is it includes two more modules and includes the middle school. So the middle school ISP program is going to start working on this with us as well. That way there's a continuation. If they go from ISP from the middle school to the high school, they'll have a continuation of the programming. Um, so there's eight modules. The lessons are 25 minutes long, which is perfect um, for our students. In my program currently, we actually break our blocks into 30 minutes so that we get more classes, more opportunities for them to learn, um, more focus on their academics and social emotional. So the school connect is the, the big thing is basically connecting with your school. And the modules are broken down, you know, right from the foundations of School Connect, which is getting to know your class in school, all the way up to building relationships, rever resolving conflict, and then setting long-term goals, setting um, employment goals, building relationships, resolving conflict. These are all covered in those. Um, and the way that we track whether or not this is successful is in our program, we have data tracking. So the students have there's uh, categories of behaviors. We track their data based on the periods and the blocks. We take that data, apply it to their goals, and then we determine based on the measurements of uh, whether it's academic, the behavior data that we're tracking, teacher observation records, and referrals. Um, we'll use all that to determine whether or not the program is being effective. And as I said, we got this last year, started 4.0 this year. And, uh, and we're just getting that up and running with our staff. Um, I am currently out for a few days due to illness, but once I get back there, um, the my goal is to work with uh, the middle school team and our team at the high school to get all the um, ed techs, all the teachers and all the social workers of the program familiar with how it works and um, the other thing that we really like about the School Connect program is it has built-in evaluations for the teachers. There's like peer evaluations as well as admin evaluations that, you know, they're already built in. The pay, uh, the the forms are there. It also has a ton of support for training, um, onboarding, getting it all set up. And prior to setting this up, we had a meeting with every member of the middle school ISP Marcus team. Marcus taking out on something. <laughs> yeah, the, everyone else is all stuck. Wait, and wait, not wait, moving. wait. Someone, someone named Par, your microphone is on, so we're hearing everything you're saying. Oh, I think sure. you want to mute that. Is there someone named Par? What? I don't know. I didn't hear anything, Andrew. Like, I have, I don't know any. Someone, 
someone again who's on the screen and the the name says P A R R. You're gonna have to mute your microphone. Or John, can you do that from? Oh, there it is. Yep. It's muted. Okay, go ahead, bud. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, so we we met with the entire middle school team, uh, the high school team, uh, the embedded social workers, the BCBAs, and um, we met with them and the School Connect people before we um, got the program up and running this year. And so far, as I said, we're just starting, but I have done lessons with my with my <clears throat> students. And as Cooper and Colden mentioned, the hardest thing uh, or one of the hardest things is the self-determination, the 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 desire, the the want to continue to go to school, to go to school and to connect. And that's why I think the program's beneficial. It does help with that. And the students that are engaged are showing progress. They've shown a ton of progress, both academically and social emotional. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Bud? All right, seeing none. So next is our student rep, right? Thank you for being here. Hi guys, I don't know if you, well, some of you know who I am. I'm Jillian Barnard. Um, I'm the school board's junior representative for the high school. And there's a lot of thoughts that have definitely been talked about that I've personally thought about where I see them at the high school or out of school but just relationships in general um but i'm gonna stick to mostly the learning and the relationships of what happens with those students and how we respond or how i personally respond and my peers respond to um some of those programs so i have lots of friends who are in the jmg program which like mr marshall said it's an amazing program. And um, Mr. Golan, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, you said that you guys wanted more hands-on and more alternative like ideas for your kids and stuff like that. So maybe trying to implement something along those lines where those kids have that support to be like opening to those new main graduate kind of things of like, where can I go? What can I like start having my options even in middle school? Like where, what are these classes that I'm taking now? Where are they going to leave me? So those kids know like maybe let's try this. Let's try that. And there's a teacher. So maybe like trying to talk about those teachers together, like getting um, Miss Reidick, is that her name? I don't have her personally, but talking with Miss Reinick, maybe that's a good idea for the middle school and high school to talk about. Um, kind of piggybacking off of that, the big brothers, big sisters that someone mentioned, I don't know who that was, but along with the high school and middle school, if there's some way that maybe we can take some high schoolers and not just when we're talking about when they're coming in, incoming freshmen, but working with them all the way through middle school, taking high schoolers and going down to middle school, having them like partnered up and just having those relationships with older kids, seeing where they're struggling and how they can help each other. Maybe that's something we can try. These are all suggestions that I have. If anybody like has anything to say, like if anyone, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to help what I see is there's relationships that I can definitely see that would benefit each each middle school or high school or whoever um but those are just two main ones that I saw that I want to talk about um now with like the learning part attention spans of students nowadays are so much smaller than they used to be and I find myself trying to just get back into it try to focus back in during a class my classes are 75 minutes long. That's a long time for me to be sitting and trying to stay focused on one teacher or one subject. It's, it's really hard. And I know my peers struggle a lot with that and finding a way for myself and others to wanna stay engaged and 
finding something that's telling myself, okay, I need to stay engaged because this is going to help me. Because a lot of the kids, they don't know why it's helping them. They don't know why they're there. They don't know what school is to them. So I think we need to find that answer for kids and they need to find that for themselves. Why am I here? And that's a big question that is always being thrown around of school isn't a priority really to a lot of kids because they feel like there's there's nothing going for them. Like, why am I here? What, what am I gonna do with this? And I think that needs to become clear to a lot of kids and a lot of people. And I don't know how to do that. That's the problem I struggle with is, I don't know what path I wanna go on. I'm trying different things, I'm talking to different people. And I think that conversation needs to be had of what is happening now and why am I doing this? So that's my big one. And huge shout out to my high school and the middle school and the elementary schools because you guys are doing amazing things. My teachers are, they are really supportive, like really supportive. And it's hard seeing the kids and the teachers struggle with some groups of, some groups of kids that struggle with learning. Because in the long run, it's those kids that have trouble learning that are getting affected the most, not even the ones that are good at learning. It's those kids that you watch and they're struggling and they're frustrated and they're walking through the halls and maybe they're angry and you can hear them from your classroom and you're like, wow, what are they going through? But you don't know. And it's hard because like, where do you go? So that's a big struggle is where do you go with those kids? Like um, the middle school principal, Mr. Golan, I think that's how you pronounce that. That's where you're saying is, where do I take these kids once I've hit this last step? What happens now? So that's a really big question. And obviously I don't have the answer, but I think we need to focus on those kind of questions now. Not how do we get there? How do we deal with it? Those, those kind of questions. Yeah. Jill, that's much Jillian. Fun. All right. Jillian, that was wonderful. Uh, we cannot thank you enough for everything you just said. That was wonderful. That helps us understand a lot uh, as to what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, and what your classmates and others are too. So thank you. Thank you so much. I, I have a, a question for you, and others may too, but when you talk about like attention span, what do you think contributes to that um. difficulty? I definitely think a big one that was brought up with social media is that nowadays we're so um, not consumed, but I'll, I'll use the word consumed in our technology, that mm -hmm. it's hard to separate ourselves from that user. So like, I have my phone. How many of you guys have your phones like five feet from you right now? Like right. all of us, like all of us, right? Yep. And there was a study that was done that they took the phones out of the classroom completely and the kids took a test and they did exponentially better than the kids that had their phones staying five feet from them. So knowing there's a thought that there's a piece of technology sitting like right there that all your friends are on it, your parents are on it, um, outside like TikTok and stuff like that, those are on it. and. Yeah. We don't even think about it, but our mind's thinking about it all the time. Like, say you're in yep. an argument with yep. a parent, and you have to put that phone away. It goes in your backpack, which is fine. That's fine. Um, it goes in your backpack while you're in class, and then all the time, that's what you're thinking about. You're thinking about, okay. oh, my God, I didn't do the dishes, and my parents are mad, or something like that. It's, okay. or you're in a relationship, like, a relationship and one of your friends is like really upset and you can't help them and that's dwelling on you like a lot of the things is we have that instant um messaging system so we don't get a break from each other and I think that's 
definitely taken a toll on social the uh, socialization socialization yeah yeah you got it people like because you have you can talk to those people at any point in time and i think that really takes away from kids nowadays so Good that's point. why i think the attention span is so short and i'm i'm not saying that's the number one reason okay but i'm saying that's a big reason yeah sure that makes sense thank you thank you mark go ahead I think that's what I was edging towards is we were trying to craft our policy regarding electronic devices because kids never get a break from, I mean, and a lot of times they're using technology in the school too. Plus they got mm -hmm. the cell phones. There's just never time away to concentrate on the task at hand. But that being said, Jillian, did I understand you, you said you think your the kids' attention spans are getting longer? No. So short. okay, I, I, mis I misheard you then. I'm sorry. I, I thought no, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I aside from the technology point, because I don't want to get stuck on that. Yeah. Um, fine. No, we're getting shorter and shorter. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of the times it has to do with technology, but it's not all to blame for that. I think the learning ways that these kids learn nowadays is completely different than we used to, like you guys said, five, 10, 15 years ago. Um, it's not built on the sit in a classroom, learn this like curriculum, and then apply it to the job that you're gonna do. Because kids nowadays, there's so much more that they know about and that they wanna do, where they're just edging to get out of that classroom because they know what they want to do. Like some kids, they know what they want to do. And they know, I just want to go do this. This is my purpose. Like, this is what I want to do. And it's hard to sit in a classroom and know that this class isn't necessarily going to help them, but they need it to graduate. Does that make sense? Like, yes. Yeah. Like, it does make <clears throat> It, it, it makes an awful lot of sense, um, yeah. but I don't know if it's right. Um, you know, this, <laughs> I don't know if the, the children in our school, the students in our school know what is available to them and how big the world is and how many options there are to yeah. them. And without the guidance of the school, if left to their own devices, all of these options can create, I think, potentially a great deal of confusion and underachievement. If the school has a culture which has which embodies aspirations towards the you know full actualization of all of these students, and that includes going to college, then I think that we can help channel their energy and inculcate the ambition that's required for the resilience. You know, the children should be turning up to school with a fire in their belly to learn every day in order to get where they want to go. And, and where they want to go can be very, uh, can be revealed to them by the school. But I think self-discovery is not going to work, notwithstanding the availability of these electronic devices. That's my it's been a very interesting session, but uh, and I understand where Brad's coming from. That you know, there's well, agency and options are vitally important to for multiple of reasons. And I'm not saying we don't do those things, but let's also create a culture that aspires to excellence and helps the children get going in that direction. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. And to piggyback off of that is. You, like you said, there's so many options out there and that taking a step back and you saying, this is what the world has to offer. And those kids not knowing what that is and having the school provide that to them. Um, I think a lot of the kids, I don't wanna call it handholding, but a lot of the kids need that guidance, like with a teacher to be like, I don't like for that kid to be like, I don't know what I want. And it's like the teachers are overwhelmed with, I don't know where you want to go because they're not like participating well in school, if that makes sense. Because like you said, they don't have that fire in their stomach to do something, to be what they want to be. Because school, I don't want to sound like 
off topic, but school isn't their number one priority. And how do we get them to that point of where school's back at their one, like their number one priority? Like, how do we get there? Because it's hard to ask kids how to get there because they don't know either. So it's like all, everything plays together. How do we get there as a community? How do the kids understand how to get there? How do the adults understand how to prepare them to get there, but they don't even know what's there? That's, that's kind of okay. what. All right. Main. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions for Jillian before we? Go to the next step. Well, and this goes towards what I think uh, Colton was talking about earlier, or someone, where, you know, ideally it should be the parents wanting to instill into the kids this drive to learn, this drive to excellence. And that's not the reality in a lot of households, unfortunately. And so this is yet another role that the school has to undertake that is maybe little not quite traditional we 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 uh is incumbent upon the teachers and the staff and the school board <laughs> in, in in an indirect way to try to get kids you know this this really matters now it doesn't seem like it matters now but it really does and you know you just have to somehow give them the the will to keep on going and and the resilience as we talked about and stamina so so I'm glad to be back because I missed literally everything that Bud and Jillian said until about the last 30 seconds. So I want to thank both of them for saying something marvelous that I totally missed. Um, and then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give the board members a little bit of homework, and it shouldn't be too awfully dreary. I want you to read that article on extended learning opportunities that I sent you the link to. I know a couple of you have read it, but read it because that really speaks to pathways and student engagement and trying to give students something that makes them excited to come to school. It's a it's a great program and it's just one that's just now taking off. So that's your homework. If you haven't read the article, please do. And, and if you can go up to the school and talk to um, Molly, who's our coordinator for that program or Stephanie. Okay. Is there anything else? All right. Well, seeing that, I just want to let you know, staff um, and our students, that we care about you deeply. The school board cares about you deeply. We're behind everything you're doing. We support everything you're doing. We want to support you more. We want to help you figure out how best to meet the needs, the more complex needs that are happening for a lot of our students uh, and help them succeed emotionally, relationally, and academically, and eventually occupationally. So thank you all for being here. Be safe tomorrow. Don't go anywhere unless you have to. And we'll talk again next time. Anything anybody else wants to say or ask questions? Don't want to cut anything off. Anybody else, board members? Thank you, everyone, for your presentation. This is very, very well done. Uh, we appreciate your candor. Um, and all your examples. Thank you. And Jillian, thank you for your insights. Very valuable. Very. Yep. Lauren, can I just say one quick thing? Yes. 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 So I just, I would just, first of all, Jillian, I wish you had spoken before me because you said it way better than I did. Um, I just hope that we can come back to this conversation because I, I really appreciate what Jillian said because I think that it uh, does come back to engagement. And I think if you talk to you know teachers at my school, um, you know I'm married to a high school teacher. I think if you talk to high school teachers, the engagement is is maybe the one more that coming back around, and and that's engaging in school as an institution, engaging in classes, engaging in aspirations. It, it to me that is really the the great way to encapsulate it. Um, <clears throat> so I just really hope that we have an opportunity to come back around and keep talking about this. Um, cause that's a really big, uh, really big kind of onion to unpack. Um, but I think that is the key is, is we're seeing students, um, uh, <clears throat> feeling less engaged, feeling less engaged in their community, less engaged in their friendships. Um, and that's rippling into everything that's happening at school. Well said. Can Absolutely. I just 
to piggyback on that before we go, that this is what I'm taking with me from this meeting is that the social emotional curriculums that we're offering are really important tools and they there are aspects of them that are really working in the schools. But one of the major barriers to engagement that our students reporting to us is actually the issue of digital access and that we know there's myriad data and research on the consequence of dopamine receptors and devices. And so part of social emotional learning is now having to incorporate how we create spaces of digital detox within the school system to increase engagement, resiliency, and stamina. And that part of the way that you increase stamina is to actually be able to tolerate withdrawal and that we don't have systems of that as a social emotional learning protocol within our district for social for how we are going to then support our students to access academia and that that seems to be the priority that i'm taking away from this from this is that the digital aspect of that is compounding all kinds of things that our students are experiencing and that we do need to take that on as part of our social emotional learning curriculum in this district and that it's a really important um, equity and um, and justice issue for mm -hmm. our students at this time mm -hmm. to continue to be able to move forward. Yeah, yeah, I would I would really support what Rebecca just said. I, I, yeah. I believe that one hundred percent. I'd also add to that that if we can develop a common language for doing that within the district, starting from kindergarten or pre K all the way through twelfth, um, that's really going to be helpful. And I think that's going to require maybe additional professional development training. Um, ways to bring schools together so we're all using common language across the district and I would even extend that to parent uh, education so that some of the norms that we're establishing in the school that we hope to establish in our schools are then partnered with our parents so parents are on the same page and understand um, some of the uh, navigation that our students have to do in order to just to live happy engaged fulfilling educational lives um, we can't do it alone, and, and the more that we're able to bring parents into the conversation, mm -hmm. I think the more success we'll have, the more common language that we develop within the district, uh, I think the more effective these programs will be. So I would certainly support initiatives that any of the principals, staff, social workers, counselors, um, you know, bring to the, to the board, uh, you know, that will really address this, this, these issues head on. I think it's something we really need to consider carefully. Yeah, I would, I would agree. And I, I think about, you know, when I was in fourth grade and we had the dare cop come, right. We learned about these things that are bad for us and that are addictive and that we should avoid. I mean, in technology at this point is a big human experiment, right? We're not, we don't know if humans can handle all of this. And so we're seeing this play out and the res results of it are playing out in real time. And so there really needs to be some kind of digital literacy that you know we're we're teaching kids from a young age um about you know what this all means because you know as Jillian said we, we probably all have our phones nearby and you know don't do what I do you know that kind of thing and and my daughter is a sophomore in high school and I've watched she didn't get a phone until she was 14 and I watched how she was able to have relationships with people in a way that most of her peers weren't able to because she was all doing it face to face. And now she's in a school where most of the people don't know how to have a conversation face to face. And it's it's heartbreaking. Okay. Um, all right, anything else? I want to bring up. All right. Again, seeing none, thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here, part of this conversation. I think staff, you can see from the school board that we're committed to doing this with you, figuring it out, providing the best culture and opportunities and education we can for our students. All right, see y'all later. Be safe tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.